Hey everyone, it's Sunday morning, it's 11 o'clock, and you're so very welcome to worship here at Central. Wherever you are, uh, however you find yourself this morning, whatever kind of weekend you're having, our prayer is that God meets you where you are this morning, that you encounter him through his word and worship and prayer, and that your home, uh, your living room, your bedroom, wherever you are right now, becomes a place of encounter with the real and risen Lord this morning. I just have a couple of bits to run through and then I'm going to pray. I'm going to hand over to Jamie, who's leading worship for us this morning, and then on to Rick, uh, who's speaking today on the next of our, in our devoted series as he speaks on prayer and fasting today. The first is to say, uh, how did you go last week um, with last week's practice, which was silence and solitude? How did you find it? Um, did you find it easy? Was it difficult? We were together with our community on Wednesday night and everyone was sharing just how difficult they find the idea of silence and solitude in their life. An awful lot of positive kind of feedback and thoughts and comments about that little line and what Helen had to say about little solitudes, little moments in your day, little practices where you grab a minute, maybe even less, just to be silent uh, and to ask for God to, to speak and to move in your heart and in your life. But how have you found it? That's what we want to know most. Why don't you let your community leaders know, chat in your comms about uh, how it's been going over this last week. Next week's practice, uh, which Rick is uh, has been is going to be speaking on today and that he kind of leads into uh, the little sheet um, that I'll give you what you're going to be doing in this next week it will drop today later on, later on this evening so to get that you need to be on our mailing list if you would like to join our mailing list uh, then why don't you uh, drop us an email at central at carnmoney.org or get in touch with us via any of our social media channels and we'll get you on that list make sure you're receiving the devoted practices materials each week as we go along through this series. So this next week will be prayer and fasting. We'd love to hear how that's going. In terms of our midweek stuff, okay, so obviously this week was our community week. Um, we pray that uh, you had a really good time within your communities, that you were able just to meet face to face with other people, talk about how it's going, what Jesus is saying and doing in your lives. And I hope that that was good. If you're not yet part of a community, and lots of people are asking us all the time, then get in touch with us, central at carmoney.org, or else our social channels, and we'll try and get you slotted in with the community here at Central. It is a bizarre thing to me, uh, just very strange to think about how many new people have joined us in this season, people that I have not yet met. So I want to say to you, especially if you're tuning in today, you're beginning to call Central your home, but I and our leadership team haven't yet met you. You are so very welcome today. We hope that you're plugging in, getting to know people, however possible that might be. We would love to connect you to things like communities, which are a great way to take your next steps. And with that in mind, next week's midweek practice uh, is input. As you'll know, the rhythm that we've been doing with our midweek activities has been to do communities, walks, worship, and input. This is our first input night, and we're doing a, a leadership hangout with the central leadership team. We're really excited about it. You are all invited. Uh, I'm really excited about the prospect of like, you know, 50, 60, 70 people on a Zoom as we chat through different issues of life and faith and following Jesus in this particular time and leadership. And for that, we would really love your questions. So you'll have got an email through the week uh, or the invite email for today is just the same. And that has a link where you can click, you can give us your, your question that you want to ask the leadership team, and we'll pitch into that on Wednesday night. So that's this Wednesday night, Central Leadership Hangout happening at 8 p.m. on Zoom. You will get an email on Wednesday with the link so that you can click and join us. We would love you all to join us. We think it's going to be super fun and a great way for you to meet the leadership team and for us to dig into issues that you're asking about and you're wrestling with at this very point in time. So please do engage. It's going to be great fun if you do. Thank you to those of you that have already asked some questions. We're looking forward to digging into them on Wednesday night. That's really it for today. Oh, one last thing. Uh, pre-service prayer. Uh, I just want to say that we have been running pre-service prayer for the last number of weeks, and uh, it's been great to have lots of you jumping in with that. Really, it's our opportunity uh, at 10.30 in the morning to gather really as the wider church. It started really as the ministry team gathering, and then we thought, well, why don't we throw it open wider to whoever really wants to join us in prayer, seeking the Lord on the Lord's day, seeking him for our church community, for our city, for the many situations and circumstances that we hold and we are 
are looking towards as a people. And so you're all invited to that. Again, if you want to get involved with that, it's on Zoom at 10.30 every Sunday, and the link goes out in the invite email for Sunday. So again, if you want to get that, you need to be on our mailing list. So drop us an email or a message, and we'll get you on that list so that you can join us for pre-service prayer on Sundays before we start our Sunday gatherings. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to hand over to Jamie, who's leading us today, and uh, then he'll hand on to Rick, who'll follow through the rest of our service today. Why don't you, wherever you are this morning, bow your head, close your eyes, pray, and let's just wait on the Lord for a moment. So God, we wait for you. And we just take a moment now, Lord, in these seconds of silence, to ask that you, the real and risen Lord, would come to us now. Jesus, we gather all the broken bits of our lives. We gather all the aspirations and all the hopes and all the fears and all the failures and all the successes, Lord, and the stuff that would be termed deepest longing to the stuff that would be called just a current want. And Jesus, we bring it before you today. And we ask you, God, would you take it? Would you shoulder it? Would you lift it from us? Because we can't. God, we want to follow you with all of our lives. We want to be faithful to who it is you're making us to be. We want to be faithful uh, to your goodness, to your faithfulness, to your mercy and your grace, to who you are. Jesus, we want to walk in your way in these days. So God, we ask this Sunday, would you come to us wherever we are? Would you say what you want to say to us today? God, as we think about prayer and fasting, as we think about how devoted we are, how devoted we truly are to you, Jesus, would you come to us today? Would you challenge us? Would you peel back layers? Would you lift off stuff that we are carrying that only you can? Jesus, come to us. And abide with us today. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, Central. Great to be joining with you this morning uh, as we consider the themes of prayer and fasting as part of your devoted series. In considering prayer, I wonder if we ever view prayer a bit like we treat a vending machine. You approach it whenever you want something. Maybe you try to press the right buttons, say the right thing, and kind of expect to immediately receive it. Have you ever treated prayer a bit like that? Or, or maybe you've treated prayer a bit like some of us might treat a, a visit to a distant relative. We have good memories of time spent with them, but they're maybe just not as regular as they used to be. We know the right things to say, but as we speak, we glance at our watch to see if we've kind of spent enough time there. We're fond of them, but just not that familiar. Jesus longs for more than just an occasional conversation with us whenever something goes wrong. To see prayer as an emergency hotline on speed dial whenever there's something that we need is to miss entirely the heart of prayer. Because prayer isn't just about seeing a change in our circumstances. It's also about crafting an ongoing relationship with God. What if prayer wasn't so much just about revolutions as it was about relationship? What if prayer isn't just about the answers that we might get, but the presence that we receive? Pete Gregg says this, when we pray, God sometimes does a miracle and airlifts us out of our problems, but more often he parachutes in to join us in the midst of them. Prayer provides us with a renewed perspective of our world as we are invited to spend time in God's presence. And while our prayers might not always affect others, they can profoundly shape us as we encounter the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Essentially, prayer changes us. So how did Jesus equip his disciples to pray? I want to read this morning from Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 18. If you've got a Bible near you, I'd love you to open it and uh, flick and turn to this passage with me and read along as I read it and as I share um, from it this morning. Jesus talking about fasting and prayer, Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling on like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 
For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will not forgive, will also forgive you. Verse 15, but if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil in your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Amen. Much of that passage forms what's commonly known as the Lord's Prayer. It has become probably the, the world's most famous prayer. And we may well have prayed these words maybe in a church service in our lives or in a school assembly growing up, and they can so easily trip off, um, trip off our tongue. But rather than viewing these words as a script to recite, they should be seen as a model or a framework for prayer because Jesus was instructing his disciples on the way they pray as much as the words they were to pray. He covers when to pray, where to pray, and what to pray. So firstly this morning, Jesus' emphasis is on when they pray. Notice that it's not an if, but a when. Look with me to verse six. Jesus started by saying, when you pray. There's an expectation that prayer will be a normal part of our lives. Just as natural as breathing or eating, prayer should become an automatic habit that is a constant rhythm in our lives. It was Jesus' expectation that prayer would be normal behavior for his followers. So what's your rhythm? When we got engaged, Sarah and I decided that we would take time to read a book together as part of preparing for getting married, for marriage. One area that we wanted to grow in was our prayer life together. And so we began reading a book called Too Busy Not to Pray. And we found it helpful. We enjoyed the book. We, you know, it challenged us. We read it faithfully. We talked about it. We dissected it. But after a while, we realized that we were spending more time reading about prayer and talking about prayer rather than actually praying. And sometimes I w worry that that's our problem in the church. We talk about religious stuff and church things and morality and techniques, but all of the talk doesn't actually affect our hearts or change our habits. We know the information about prayer, but that information doesn't actually cause us to turn to Jesus in need, desperation, love, and devotion to pour out our hearts to him. It's easy to talk about praying with God, but actually it's so much harder to form the habit of doing it. And that's because prayer can be demanding. It rarely offers easy answers. It calls us to keep trusting and keep persisting with God until his time of answering arrives. And sometimes his answer turns out to be something completely different from whatever we started out asking for. It doesn't so much bend God to our ways, but sometimes it can blend our lives to his. The habit of prayer will make a huge difference in our lives as it opens up everyday conversations with our Heavenly Father. It shapes the mind of Christ in us. It unleashes the power of the Holy Spirit through us. And getting into good patterns and rhythms of prayer eventually will make us and turn us and shape us into prayerful people. And persistently prayerful people never find themselves far from the will of God. Jesus makes it clear that for his followers, prayer isn't an if but a when. But secondly, where are we to pray? Now we might assume that the answer is anywhere and technically that is true, but Jesus actually tells his followers where their primary place of prayer should be. He says, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who, is, who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling on like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Now, Jesus is not saying that we can only pray in our rooms, 
but he was actually demonstrating a major shift here in people's thinking. Up until this point, people accessed God in the temple. That was the only way that he was accessed at certain times and by certain people. However, Jesus was showing that God was now just as present in the isolation of a bedroom as he was in the most impressive of cathedrals. You are noticed in the secret place. Our needs are heard in the silent space. And Jesus is really clear here on praying without show. There's no need for it. He directs his disciples towards private moments of secret devotion rather than public displays of lofty expression. Prayer is often far more hidden than it is public as our Father in heaven invites us to relationship and draws us into personal conversation with him. A pastor once told a story of someone who died in his church and in preparing for his funeral, he asked his wife what this man was like at home. The man's wife brought him to a chair in their house and invited the pastor to sit down in it. She went on to explain that every morning her husband sat in that chair to read the scriptures, to pray. And she went on to say that in that chair, he became a better husband, a better dad, a better employee, and a better church leader. Find your chair. So where is your chair? Your private devotion is more important than your public cry. And what God wants to do through you, he first wants to do in you. And to enable that, we need to build rhythms of prayerful devotion to our lives. A space to be silent, a place for solitude, space for God's word and a place for prayer. So what rhythm do you have or are you building or creating in your life for prayer? Find your chair. And perhaps that might help us to begin to view prayer as living every moment with an awareness of God in the everyday, rather than just calling him to bless us in a short-lived experience. So Jesus teaches his disciples when to pray, where to pray, and also what to pray by guiding them in the tone and the content of their prayers. Now, now, please understand these words written here in Matthew 6, you know, there's no right format or formula for prayer. There's not a set script, or, um, but actually these words are to be like a flexible framework because in the face of it, prayer is such a simple thing. It requires no fancy phrases, no winsome words, just as parents love listening to the murmurs of their toddler. In the same way, we can come before God just as we are, knowing that he welcomes us as his babbling children. Our youngest son, Micah, has been slightly slower to develop in his speech. At one stage, there were no coherent phrases and just ceaseless streams of babbling came from his mouth. But you know what? We absolutely loved listening to him. We, we actually learned how to have a good conversation with him too. And we didn't turn his requests away from us because of his lack of eloquence. You know, come back to us whenever you've learned to say that properly. No. We wanted to listen to him and hear him just the way he, he approached us and the way he spoke. And I think that picture should lift the pressure off, um, off us to perform before God or to impress others who we might be praying with. Impressive phrases and fancy words aren't needed to impress God. Come as you are. I think we need to learn to just be with Jesus as babbling children in the arms of a father caught up in each other's presence. As desperate disciples contending for cultural change because we're powerless to change anything by ourselves. Through prayer, God changes things, changes situations and people's lives and he changes us. And so Jesus offers us a framework to help us with what we should pray. It shouldn't be seen as a rigid structure, but a flexible framework to get us started in conversation with God. It might help you get started. It starts with our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This was actually a paradox. Jesus was using the word Abba, which literally is translated as dad. And yet he was also reminding us that God's name is holy. We can recognize and address God as a close father, not just a distant deity, 
Yet we should also recognize the uniqueness of his name. Dad, holy is your name. It starts with adoration, with adoring him and and telling him and confessing who he is, worshiping God for who he is. But then the prayer moves on. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And while the first part of this prayer is about adoration, the next parts are about intercession and petition. Intercession, asking for other people's needs. Petition, asking for our own needs. And both are appropriate. As we pray, we should ask for the realities of heaven to be known around us. And we can also ask for God to provide for our daily needs. The things that we know of in heaven, a lack of sadness, perfect peace, closeness with God, no sickness. We can ask God for those things to be a reality here on earth where we are in Belfast, God, as it is in heaven. Prayer is about desiring change in the world around us as we name our frustrations and failures to the one with the ultimate power to change them. This world is broken. Just look at the news and it desperately needs a heavenly touch on earth as it is in heaven. Then the prayer moves on. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And so our request should include things like forgiveness for our shortcomings, help in the face of trouble, and also protection from the enemy as we face temptation. These things remind us that actually we're in a battle and we need help. And so as you pray, what forgiveness do you need to seek? Name them before God. What temptations do you need to bring before God? And where do you need protection from the enemy? And don't forget there's a connection between the forgiveness that we receive from God and the forgiveness that we offer to others. So how do we get started in prayer? Use this as a framework given to you by Jesus. Start with adoration. Address God and acknowledge who he is. Dad, holy is your name. Then move to naming situations around you that you want God to intervene in. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Acknowledge the needs you have yourself. Give us today our daily bread. And then ask God to help you in specific temptations and challenges you're facing. Forgiveness, temptations, and evil. It's not a script, but it's a framework. A few years ago, I remember picking up Noah from Kingdom Kids one Sunday morning after church. And he came out clutching a little teaspoon, a little plastic white teaspoon, and told us that this was his, now his prayer spoon. On that spoon were the letters T, S, and P. And that morning, the leaders had taught him how prayer involved saying thanks to God, sorry to God, and please to God. That night on his bed, Noah clutched his little spoon and used that as a way to pray. He thanked God for Paw Patrol, genuinely. And then he said that he couldn't think of anything that he wanted to say sorry for, and I told him to think much harder. And we eventually remembered some things. And then he asked God to help him with something the next day. It wasn't eloquent, but it was a start. At that point, if I'm honest, we didn't have a regular rhythm of praying with our son. But that little spoon gave us the rhythm for prayer over the next few months. And we've kind of graduated on to maybe slightly deeper prayers since then. Please remember, prayer isn't a script, but a framework can be helpful. So do you have one? What's your framework? Maybe you could use this prayer this week as your framework. Before I finish this morning, I just want to address one final part of Jesus' instructions about prayer in this passage because he goes on to speak about the area of fasting. And while we might better understand or more instinctively understand something like prayer, often we might wish to ignore fasting as a spiritual practice. But throughout the, two, throughout the Bible, sorry, the two, prayer and fasting, are often and frequently linked together. In fact, Jesus was explicit about the discipline of fasting, just like he was about prayer. Again, it's a case of when, not if, with Jesus. He said, when you fast, do not look somber like the hypocrites do. But when you fast, put oil in your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only 
to your father who is on scene. You see, it doesn't really sound like an optional extra for the super spiritual. And yet that's how fasting has often been categorized. Perhaps maybe even as you listen to this this morning, you might think that fasting just sounds a little bit extreme. Yet it was a normal expectation that Jesus had for his followers. Jesus actually said that man doesn't live by bread alone. Yet often it's food rather than prayer that creates the rhythm for our days. So the act of fasting actually creates disruption to the normal pattern of our lives to allow us space to develop more awareness of the Holy Spirit leading and guiding us. Fasting is an opportunity to disrupt some of the things that have the biggest hold in our lives. Fasting is the voluntary denial for a set period of time of an otherwise normal function in order to experience an intense communion with God. It's the act of abstaining from food or other things. So our desire for God, his presence, his love, his voice and his power will increase in our lives. John Tyson writes this about fasting. He says, the power is not the practice. The practice is a portal to the person of Jesus. Let me say that again. The power is not the practice. Fast, and Sorry, the power is not the practice. The practice is a portal to the person of Jesus. And that's just it. The habit of prayer and fasting is actually there to drive us closer to the heart of God. Fasting is not the power, but fasting is the practice that opens us up to the person and the power of Jesus more. I love some of the understatements in the Bible. And in reference to a 40-day fast of Jesus, Luke records that he ate nothing during those days. And at the end of them, he was hungry. I'll, I'll bet he was hungry. It's fairly obvious that 40 days without food would have that result to anyone. But you see, it's important that Luke records this because he was making it clear that Jesus experienced the same human feelings and cravings that you and I do. He got hungry. Fasting wouldn't have been easy, even for the Son of God. And so the process of not eating for 40 days and participating in this fasting would have been challenging for Jesus. And even so, it was still a part of Jesus' life. If I'm honest, I've been so challenged recently about developing this rhythm in my own life. For me, that's actually been fasting from my phone for an hour every day and a day every week. It goes in a drawer, I don't look at it, and I use some of that time to pray and seek God. And what's most amazing is that when I take that device out of the drawer again, the world hasn't caved in. Everything is still in place. Yet in that time, the act of fasting has actually disrupted me. It's disrupted the hold that technology has on me. It's disrupted the sense of urgency over every communication. It's disrupted my day and given me space to seek God. Disrupting the routine of eating a meal or looking at my phone provides me with a window of time to pray. David Mathis writes that fasting was a desperate measure for desperate times among those who know themselves desperate for God. And I confess to you this morning that I am desperate. I'm desperate for more of God. I need him more and more in my life. And surely, if ever our souls, our church, our community, and our nation needed healing, needed redemption, needed Jesus, it's now. And so I wonder if at this time, if God could once again be calling his people to fast and pray in simple obedience, as a consistent rhythm for God's transforming power. I'm done, but I just want to suggest two ways that you could develop in these habits this week. Firstly, to help you develop a habit of prayer, why don't you pick a time and a place to pray the Lord's Prayer every day this week? Set an alarm to remind you, pray it wherever you are. Use it as a framework or a lunch pad to pray and deepen your own prayer from then. So find a time and a place to pray the Lord's Prayer. And secondly, why don't you fast from something that you normally depend on? Pick a day this week to abstain from one meal 
that you would normally eat and dedicate that time to prayer. Or put your phone in a drawer for a day and every time that you think about taking it from your pocket, use it as a prompt to pray. The folks at Central are going to give you a resource, provide you, email you a resource to help you to develop some of these habits this week. I'd encourage you to step into them and think about how to form habits over time as you step into them more fully. To close in prayer this morning, I'm going to use the Lord's Prayer. We so often say it that actually maybe we may not take time to listen to it. So I'm going to pray it slowly and invite you to listen this morning for what phrase stands out to you. What is the Holy Spirit highlighting to you through this prayer? And then I'd encourage you to share that with someone in your home or your community or on social media in some way. But let's still ourselves to pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
his arms he'll take his shoes.